Warning. The following video contains disturbing images, including but not limited to blood, gore, and violence, as well as discussions of physical, mental, and psychological disorders and trauma. Viewer discretion is advised. No, seriously, if you can't handle this, get the fuck out. Oh, what a terrible night to have a countdown. Happy Halloween, my fiendish followers, the Green Scorpion here, with one more spooky video for the year. I said previously that we'd be revisiting some of my original countdowns, but as long as we're in this hallowed season, I thought we'd unearth a specific countdown first. One I sealed away in shame, hoping it might never see the light of day, lest I unleash its outdated horrors upon the world. I'm talking, of course, about my top 10 horror games. Man, this one's pretty cringe-inducing to look back on, but today I'm gonna make like a necromancer and raise it better and stronger than ever. And I'm not gonna do this alone. As with last time, I've consulted some help. Uh, Shika, what are you doing? I am not Shika. I am the ghost of Countdown's past. Okay, I gotta stop you right there. Look, the whole artist invading other artists' videos thing is really out of date. People just want us to get to the point. All right, well, fine. If you want to get to the point, it's because the old list was kind of dog shit. Well, you don't have to be mean about it. It's been nine years since that video. Horror, and thus horror games, have come a long way since then, and we need to up our game if we're gonna do this subject any justice. That means we gotta be more discerning with our choices. No action games that are just horror-themed, no cheap horror riding off of Twitch streamers' reactions, and we are not talking about the goddamn bear. Yeah, please don't. Jump scares are but one tool in the utility belt of horror, and you can't build a whole game with one tool. If you can't tell already, Sheikah's a little more passionate about this genre than I am. Hey, horror is serious business, alright? And while I don't usually go out of my way to test my sanity, I do love me a good video game. So I'll be tackling this list in terms of game mechanics and overall playability. And I'll be judging these games based on atmosphere and the effect that they leave on the player. Horror games grade on a very different scale to most other genres. More so than other game types, they can make artistic choices that make the game less fun if it means enhancing the dread or terror you feel while playing it. So we need to ask ourselves. Does the game make you hesitate to continue playing, but can it convince you to keep playing anyway? Does the game make you feel uncomfortable? I don't want to be comfy, I want to be spooked. Does the game's graphics, music, and if possible gameplay enhance its themes and atmosphere? And can it elicit a feeling that not only lasts over the game's runtime, but follows the player after the credits have rolled? Fear is incredibly subjective, and most importantly, personal. So it's hard to make an empirical ranking on which games are scariest. Still, we'll use these concepts to make a list of the best of the best. We'll also be leaving most of these games' mysteries intact in case you want to seek them out for yourself, which I highly recommend. And obviously these games are full of disturbing imagery, discussions of mental health and suicide, blood, gore, all that good stuff. I know it should go without saying, but we're going to assume that if you're watching this, you're a responsible adult that is smart enough to know their limits. If that's too much for you, please leave the video now. We're not judging you. You do what you gotta do. GTFO, bitches! Oh, boy. So, without further ado... <sighs> I am the Green Scorpion. And I'm Sheikah Arts, and this is our top 15 horror games. Wait, 15? There's a lot of good ones out there, starting with this honorable mention. So... 
It's a top 16. No stopping now, Oscar. It's time to lean into the darkness. In 2014, we got a nearly perfect horror experience that tragically did not see the light of day. The Enigmatic PT. Seven years later, I find myself wondering if this game even actually existed. It's like a real-life creepypasta. Developed by the mad fictionalist Hideo Kojima himself under a pseudonym, the game largely consists of walking down this same dark hallway again and again and again. Sometimes something happens, most of the time it doesn't. Each pass through you look for anything that might have changed. Pictures on the walls, numbers by the telephone, anything that might give you a clue as to what's going on and how you can get out with the occasional HOLY SHIT WHAT IS THAT IS IT GONNA KILL ME moment. Through insanely obscure methods involving the controller's microphone, you can eventually escape the house to discover the point of all this. PT stands for Playable Teaser. And this is all a proof of concept for a future game, Silent Hills. Or is it? Because shortly after, Konami decided that it didn't want that game anymore and the project was cancelled. Kojima left the company on bad terms a year later, Silent Hill as a property was doomed to exist as a... Pachinko machine for all eternity, and PT was pulled from the PlayStation Store, so no one would ever know. PT is a great little horror package, but in this state, it's also an unfinished idea. Giving it a proper spot on the list would feel like if I put Delta Rune Chapter 1 on a top 10 RPGs list. Not even! You can get Delta Rune for free! The only way to play PT now is to buy a PS4 that still has it downloaded, which is expensive as hell! This game is an actual ghost. Well, for our purposes, let's consider PT a prime example of what we're looking for in a horror game. The deafening silence, the heart-pounding escape, and a mystery that keeps you playing despite your loss of breath. This is what all horror games should strive to be. On the previous list, we started off with a charming little indie game, Play Dead's Limbo. It's a delightful puzzle platformer where you play as this adorable rapscallion and get skewered by the leg of a tarantula! That is what happens. I still really love this game, but I think we were being a little too generous with the term horror game. Limbo is bleak, but I wouldn't say fear was the main takeaway from the experience. It's more just an interesting thinker. Doesn't make it a worse game, just not what we're looking for. Lucky for us, Play Dead struck again with Inside, a sort of evolution of Limbo's concept that I think better achieves horror in a 2D platformer. Some might say it's not horror, but all of the elements are definitely there. The story is a lot less vague this time around. It still takes some conjecture on the player's part to decide what's happening, but there's more of a mystery at hand that draws the player in. You see people being gathered up by these men with guns and dogs, being driven in droves to a strange science facility. The fact that you're a little boy makes it immediately apparent how vulnerable you are. You need to think your way around the problems because everything that moves and most things that don't are strong enough to end you in a single hit. But still, you find yourself moving deeper into danger rather than away from it. Was this boy's family taken? Are we trying to save them? What's being done to these people and why are we moving closer to the scary stuff? I think that's the real key here. A common tactic in horror game design, the puzzles often ask you to put yourself in more danger to pull a switch or open a gate. Take these swimming segments. You know there's a creepy ring girl underwater that will give you a big old drowny hug if she catches you. But if you want to get to the next platform, you gotta swim by her. Your progression depends on it, so it's up to you to lead her around and figure out how best to make that next bit of progress. And then there's this part with the submarine. This hits me really hard because I've always had this horrible fear of drowning. Blah, yeah, me too. It's the freaking worst. And the camera pans out just to show you how hopelessly deep you are with nothing but an inch of glass between you and thousands of tons of water. And can I just say, the way this game handles is amazing. The boy is just slow and weighty enough to make you sweat when something is chasing you, but all of the actions are mapped to one button so you never need on-screen prompts for anything. And it's just a great game feel. Everything about it is not only a better horror game, but a better puzzle game and a better platformer. Especially the ending. 
Yeah, I'm not gonna spoil anything, but that last segment takes a turn that really fucks me up. My jaw hit the floor. It is so messed up and so fun. Playdead is a developer to keep an eye on. Their next project, Somerville, is going to keep developing this style of spooky side-scroller, and I am here for it. I'm going to be looking at our original list a lot today. Back then, we gave a lot of reverence to Eternal Darkness, which I still think is a good game in everything. But let's be honest, this game is a cult classic for two reasons. It's the only M-rated game published by Nintendo, and it has the fake blue screens and memory card corruptions. Yeah, it's a neat trick and all, but here in 2021, a lot of games are leaning on this kind of fourth wall breakage, and honestly, it's getting pretty stale. Undertale, Super Hot, One Shot, Anodyne. I mean, I like these games, but I'm not really impressed anymore by the whole self-aware game thing. Quick honorable mention to Doki Doki Literature Club, which in theory is a great surprise horror game, but in practice... If you're playing this game, it's because you already know the twist. It takes a long time for the game to show its true colors, and even if you somehow went in totally blind, all the trigger warnings probably prepared you for that dark turn. I mean, I'm glad they put the trigger warnings there for everyone, but it does soften the blow. But if there's one game that really nails the surprise, it's a horror game angle, it's Pony Island. And by putting it at number 14, we're telling more people about it, so the twist is gonna work on less people. Ah, damn you, internet. Well, if there's one compliment I can pay Pony Island, it's that even if you know the elevator pitch going in, it's still full of surprises. You play as a man trapped in a desolate arcade, forced to interact with an out-of-date computer. As you click around the retro interface, trying to make something happen, you stumble upon Pony Island, an unremarkable runner game that was actually made by the devil. And like a maniacal game dev, Satan plans to trap you here and force you to enjoy this hackneyed game jam project. Again, this isn't a fully original concept. Dare Evil also deserves a mention. It's like the sister game to this one, but I think Pony Island delivers more on the full package. As you work to escape your 8-bit hell, you have to go into the code of the in-game computer in between rounds of Pony Island, each step devolving the game into a freakier, glitchier mess. Subjective comment here, but putting glitchy effects in a game is a really easy way to freak me out. And like any good metagame, Pony Island constantly changes the rules with clever tricks. It doesn't just break the fourth wall, affecting your in-game character outside the in-game computer. It eventually chips away at the eighth wall, forcing you to interact with your own computer. There's a simple things like knowing when you've minimized a window or taking away your ability to pause. But then there were moments where I really started to feel like the game was possessed. Like, how do you do that, Pony Island? Probably the biggest mindfuck of this game occurs after you've finished it. You're done with the game, but you've bought into the narrative that the game file itself is evil, and as long as it sits in your Steam library, the devil's kind of winning. I should delete it, right? B but I paid five bucks for this, I can't just remove it from my library, what if I want to play it again? Definitely a weird take on a horror game, playing more on psychological horror than any normal phobias, but it had me frightened enough to up my antivirus software after my first playthrough. I know it's evil, but it was like five dollars! Uh, Chica, are you okay? Look, I'm an artist for a living, I can't afford to be permanently deleting games. Do you know how many chicken nuggets I could buy with five dollars? I don't know, ten? You say that so nonchalantly. Finally, some overlap from the old list. At number 13, we have Amnesia. A machine for pigs. Not the Dark Descent? Yeah, I know this one is going to be... divisive amongst our viewers. Yeah, no kidding. Care to explain? Gladly. The Dark Descent was a huge touchstone when it came out. All the so-called horror games were bombastic shooters with big guns and, sure, scary enemies, but scary isn't horror. The Dark Descent brought subtlety back into the genre, but it doesn't really hold up. That's... Uh, yeah, actually, I can't really deny that. The sound design especially. It's either complete silence, or it basically just screams at you for eight hours straight. It's a non-stop adrenaline rush, but a player can only sustain sheer terror for so long before they get desensitized. It's the same reason why Outlast didn't quite make this list. 
In comparison, a machine for pigs has ebbs and flows, long periods of unease as you solve the puzzles and uncover the macabre plot to avoid these awful pig monsters. Yeah. I don't like glitches. Sheikah doesn't like pigs. I like to eat pigs, specifically in barbecue. I just don't like them chasing me. I will admit, I do like the weird social commentary happening here. It takes place in a Victorian factory, the pigmen representing the undervalued working class being treated as a resource to slaughter by the bosses above. And the way you're just a tiny ant in what feels like a big whirling machine? I don't use this word lightly, but it's Kafka-esque. Hey, see? Now you're getting it. But I think the gameplay took a big hit. There's no sanity gauge anymore, and your health recovers over time, so that kind of hurts the sense of urgency. And all of that to accommodate them dropping the inventory system, so now all of the puzzles are basic carry X to Y actions. This game is almost a walking simulator. Okay, but how important were the puzzles to the first amnesia, really? Puzzles are the things you do to take your mind off the monsters so they can scare the piss out of you when they show up again. The level design also gets more varied with open areas that deprive you of hiding spots. And again, the sound design is so much better. That's so important for a horror game and I cannot stress that enough. Not just to achieving high octane fear, but also that creeping dread of what's around the corner. And shout out to Jessica Curry for an amazing soundtrack. Just don't listen to it before bed. I did that once and sleeping did not happen afterwards. Yeah, I guess I see what you mean. If I go back and play The Dark Descent now, I kind of know how to optimize my run so I'm never in any danger. You actually aren't in any danger in a machine for pigs most of the time either, but at the time, it sure feels like it. And I guess it gave me more to chew on as a narrative. Yeah, and you can chew on bacon too. But honestly, I'm just not into the whole walking sim aspect, so I'm keeping it at number 13. Oh, what? You don't like walking? Because I can see to it that you never do that again. Could you not threaten me right now? I'm going to break those spindly little legs of yours. Going from a really great soundtrack to... Well, these songs... They're a genre. A genre that's not for everybody. Anyway, our next game is the Polish indie game, The Cat Lady. The Cat Lady? Yeah, it's a point-and-click style adventure. Oh, so like Clock Tower. Nah, dude, this game makes Clock Tower look like Sam and Max. The Cat Lady is the second in the Devil Came Through Here trilogy and delves deep into some very, very heavy themes of suicide, domestic abuse, infanticide, and terminal illness. Wow, so not like Clock Tower. Yeah, I think I'd rather have the Goofy Scissorman. Our main character is Susan Ashworth, a woman who really wants to die but has been granted immortality. Oh, so it's like Xenosaga. If you keep doing this, we're never gonna get anywhere. Sorry. Upon a suicide attempt, Susan arrives in a purgatory-like setting and is told by an entity called the Queen of Maggots that to earn her death, Susan will have to rid the world of five psychopaths that are deemed parasites. What follows is an ever-deteriorating nightmare. Okay, I see what you mean by point-and-click style. Everything is actually done on the arrow keys, kind of clunky, but it does make the game feel more grounded. And this art style! You remember the scary stories to tell in the dark books that were always at your elementary school book fairs? It's kind of like that, but a video game. A very... Slow video game. Yeah, it's pretty rough around the edges, but a lot of times that works in a horror game's favor. All throughout, you'll see everything bleed together. Reality, dreams, delusions, and the supernatural until you're not really sure what's diegetic to the story and what isn't. And some of these psychopaths are really off the wall, too. I mean, they're absolutely brutal. But weirdly, the game was scariest to me when it was grounded in reality. Mental illness is scary, man. Well, this is certainly the most upset I've felt from any of these games so far. Well, strap in, bug boy. Because the abyss gets much deeper than that. Ugh, what did I get myself into? I wish I could say more about this one, but it just has to be played to be understood. And even then, I don't think I understand it. It always feels like something is about to go wrong, and sometimes it doesn't, and you get some silly moments. But it always feels like it could. You know, a little bit like real life can be sometimes. So next we have... Papers, Please? 
Are you going to tell me that Papers, Please is a horror game? No, it's more of a political thriller, but it gives me a good jumping off point. You see, the intrigue of Papers, Please is more about the implications. You're doing the mindless task of checking people's immigration papers, but you know you're doing it because everything in the world is falling apart. Presentable Liberty is a lot like Papers, Please, but so much darker. Um, well, I'm looking at it now, and all I'm seeing is footage in this same room. Is this another game with zero actual gameplay? Yes and no, but mostly yes. Presentable Liberty sees you in the shoes of this nameless prisoner whose only contact with the outside world comes in the form of these letters and the occasional gift added to his cell. It seems there is some kind of virus killing off 98% of the population. Yikes. Yeah, this was made in 2014 and wasn't quite as topical then. Anyway, the horror from this game comes not from what you see, but mostly from what you're forced to imagine is happening off screen. And you're helpless to stop it over the course of five days. Huh. You know, that reminds me of another one room horror game that takes place over five units of time. Finish that comparison and your life is over. Okay, I'm all for subversive indie games, but is this really a horror game? Feels more like a political thriller. Well, what is genre anyway? What is genre? We didn't include Metroid Fusion or Dead Space because it only incorporated horror elements and now you're trying to sneak in this Minecraft mod? Have you actually played the game? Okay, hang on a second. One hour later. Okay, I get it now. Told ya. Yeah, you really need to experience it for yourself. A lot of it is in the sound design. The droning of the creaky building you're in, the ticking of the clock. I spent a lot of time expecting something horrible to happen. And it does, just not to you. The letters you get from Salvador the Traveler and Charlotte the Baker, two of the last survivors on Earth, get darker and darker as the day goes on. Charlotte especially is so alone, begging you to give her some sort of sign that you're real and that she's not wasting her time writing to you, but you can't actually respond, and all you do is try to pass the time between mail deliveries, be it playing these awful Game Boy games or just staring at the walls. These games are delivered to you by Mr. Smiley, a frankly annoying character trying to convince you that everything's okay. But you find out early that Mr. Smiley's job is to keep down the suicide rate in this prison, that most prisoners have been killing themselves in despair, and that the powers that be are holding Smiley's daughter captive, threatening to kill them unless Smiley can keep you alive. So he keeps selling all of his possessions to buy you these crappy games to keep you entertained and begging you to stay positive. I really wish I could tell him to stop. Presentable Liberty is an exercise in powerlessness. It will have you bouncing off the walls trying to find a way to signal your friends or break out of your cell. It's worth noting this game is actually part of a series called Menagerie by Robert Brock, aka Wirtpool. There's a prequel called Exploitable Money, which is a run-of-the-mill clicker game that suddenly goes horribly wrong, and a spin-off called Menagerie Archive, which notably gives you much more choice in how you handle your situation, though it turns out that makes the world no less horrible. And to address the elephant in the room, Robert Brock died in early 2018 as a result of suicide. I know it's tempting to try and examine his work for signs of his depression or to say that this makes the horror even greater, but frankly, that's insensitive. That tragedy isn't to be used as a supporting point in an essay or for our entertainment. I just felt we needed to address it as someone was sure to bring it up in the comments. Yeah, there's enough darkness within the game to earn it this spot. We've been using some unorthodox horror games on the fringes of the definition, but play this game yourself and I think you'll agree it qualifies. It's free and it only takes about an hour. Though, it'll feel a lot longer. Now, I may not be a horror game expert, but I do love me a good platformer. Inside was great, but for something a little more ambitious, we have the Namco Bandai published Little Nightmares. A short but sweet 3D platformer with incredible level design and larger than life monsters. How could it get any better? Simple. With a sequel that absolutely sticks the landing. Little Nightmares 2. Gotta agree, they did not cheap out here. 
Little Nightmares 2 takes everything great about the first game and gives us so much more, letting us see the wider world of this twisted reality, and it clocks in at double the length without feeling bloated or drawn out. Like with Inside, this series uses child protagonists to make you feel extra vulnerable, but cranks that idea up to 11. Adults in this world are giant and grotesque, and environments have oversized furniture that you have to skitter around like rats. It follows a classic horror trope of taking something ordinary and perverting the hell out of it. Hang on to that thought, we're gonna use it again a little later. Little Nightmares 2 does lean on some old horror standbys, like a school and a hospital, but these are standbys for a reason. In real life, these places are always really sterile, regimented, crowded, and you can always see rooms you're not allowed in. It's creepy being here when nobody's around. As Wamba would put it, it gives you a sense of, I really shouldn't be here right now, should I? And then the teacher shows up. Are you afraid of being alone in the dark, or are you afraid of not being alone in the dark? Yeah, screw all of these nightmares, you do not want to deal with any of them. We even get enemy children now with weird empty bobbleheads. I absolutely hate it, but in a good way, strangely. If we're gonna critique it, I'd say the game is a little too lenient with checkpoints. I'm all for making things less frustrating, but once you're aware that death is just a slap on the wrist, it might take some of the wind out of the scary sails in these stealth segments. I'm also not a big fan of Six's inclusion. She kind of falls apart in some of these escort segments. Yay, escort missions. Everybody's favorite kind of missions. I detect sarcasm. But the lighting in this game is incredible. Even though it's a 3D game, the camera fixes to give all the scenes a stage-like quality, letting them completely control the image. The first game starred Six in her yellow raincoat, and I thought it'd be harder to follow this game's hero who wears darker colors, but they went the extra mile with the backlighting of all these environments so that he always sticks out without having to sacrifice the doom and gloom. Really, really artistically brilliant stuff, guys. And the ending has this dark twist that really stuck with me after I finished it. Leaves a lot up to interpretation, but it also gives you plenty to chew on. Even if you don't consider yourself a horror fan, give this one a shot. What can we say about Silent Hill 2 that has not already been said? I know. It's not the greatest horror game of all time anymore. NOT SCIENTIFICALLY POSSIBLE! Back in 2012, our younger selves listed Silent Hill 2 as the greatest horror game of all time. Now, I'm not gonna speak for Oscar, but my younger self is an idiot baby who doesn't know what they were talking about. We're still ranking it higher than the other games on that list, which is to say that none of the other games on that list made it this time. Listen, Silent Hill 2 is to horror what Super Mario 64 is to platforming what Ocarina of Time is to adventure, what Halo 1 is to shooters. They shot some adrenaline into their genres for the new era. But we're not gonna sit here and pretend like gaming peaked in the 90s, okay? Shit's gotten way better. Absolutely. But for all the innovations made since then, I think Silent Hill 2 still holds up. In fact, it holds up so well, attempts to remaster it have only failed to capture the same sense of uneasiness. Yeah, a lot of what seems like flaws or limitations actually worked out in Silent Hill 2's favor. Most famous is the fog, which was originally implemented to cover the poor draw distance, but it makes you fear what might be outside your purview, even in broad daylight. The clunky combat became a standard for horror games. You don't want your hero to be too capable, or it comes off feeling like a Metroid game. Not cool, Sheikah. And the stilted dialogue. Is it bad voice direction, or was it purposely recorded this way to give the scenes an eerie, dreamlike quality? I'm not sure, but I also can't imagine the game without James Sunderland's stupid, stupid voice. This town is full of monsters. How can you sit there and eat pizza? Gamers are much more used to psychological elements in their horror nowadays, but the big gotcha at the end of Silent Hill 2 remains one of my favorite twists in the medium. And the soundtrack is immaculate. Some tracks are bangers, others are beautifully haunting, and some just assault you with unbearable garbage disposal noises. It's amazing. Also, the monsters. Yeah, you got your first appearance of the bubblehead nurses? And who could forget everyone's favorite acutely angled antagonist? Geometry Steve! Are you talking about Pyramid Head? A strange, unknowable horror unique to the specific circumstances of this game's story. Which is why I hate that Konami started putting him in everything. 
He's James's demon, you idiots! That's the whole point! Well, I can't say that I'm always raring to start a new run of Silent Hill 2, but it aged a lot better than some of its contemporaries. Fatal Frame, Rule of Rose, some great stories with really frustrating mechanics. But Silent Hill 2 manages to thread the needle between unwieldy and, for lack of a better term, playable. I'll just add that it's one of the longer games on this list, too. I think we learned in recent years that horror games tend to work better in short bursts, but 20 years later I'm still willing to drop 8 hours on this classic. If this list was the most influential horror games, it'd be number one for sure. But aiming for an objective best, yeah, ninth place makes sense. So I guess that means Dead Space isn't making the list either, huh? Not quite. I love Dead Space, and it's a phenomenal game, but it's definitely more of an action game with horror elements. On the flip side, Soma is a horror game with action elements, and it definitely works. Ugh, more underwater stuff. Developed by Frictional Games, who made the Amnesia and Penumbra games, Soma tells a story of Simon Jarrett, who isekai'd into a derelict subaquatic base that I'm surprised isn't connected to Rapture. Though, to be fair, Soma plays with the setting way more than Bioshock ever did. Have you ever been to a place in the ocean where you can't see the bottom? Because I have, and it's freaky as hell! It's also got robots, so it's kinda like a hideous fusion of Bioshock and System Shock. Also, I gotta correct you slightly, Frictional Games developed the first Amnesia of the Dark Descent, but only published a machine for pigs, which explains why Soma returns to some of the Dark Descent's gameplay mechanics, complete with a sanity meter that plunges you into the depths if you so much as glance at these monsters. Meanwhile, the plot delves more into the existential horror. The base AI was tasked with preserving humanity at all cost, and it interpreted that in some very unique ways, backing people's minds into bulky automatons that think they're human and grafting any remaining organic life into the machines so they can live in endless drooling torment. It explores a lot of questions about what it means to be human. Yeah, I played the Talos Principle, so this is old hat to me. But actually, I found Soma has a lot of interesting things to say about these philosophical concepts. I actually kind of wish the monsters weren't there. Anytime I was cowering for safety, I felt like it was taking time away from the real meat of the story. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Are you saying you wish it had less gameplay? Like, say, a machine for pigs? No, I'm saying th Huh. Frictional only got better with its sound design, the muffled echoes of the ocean increasing the sense of isolation. But you're not isolated. Breaking conventions for this type of horror game, you have a companion for most of it, Catherine. And normally I'd say this breaks the tension, but the game knows how comforting this second voice is, and knows the player will come to rely on it, making it all the more painful during the time she isn't available. It also allows them to characterize Simon far beyond most horror game protagonists, even more than James Sunderland. Soma's another longer game, and a lot of that time is spent waiting for patrolling fishmen to move the fuck out of the way. I can see why the sanity system dissuading us from looking at them, because once you do, they're kind of derpy looking. But all in all, I'd say two sides of this game hang together, making the reprieves more comforting and the terrors more... terrible. And as awful as things get, Soma's narrative always keeps this small speck of hope on the horizon, and knows that by doing so, it can crush your heart again and again and again, tricking you every time into thinking that there might be a way out. And is there? You're just gonna have to find out for yourself. Golden Light is an early access horror comedy first person shooter row light. Uh, Chica, what the hell is this? These words should not be all in one sentence. Oh no, Golden Light actually is all of those things. Okay, that sounds like a mess. Oh, it is, and it's great, it's glorious, I love it. You start off having a picnic with your low-res GF when suddenly she's Persephone'd away and you're tasked to save her from the gut, a sentient dungeon where everything is made of meat. Ugh. 
And I mean everything. The closer you look, the most meat you see, and everything's alive, including the maps, the items, the weapons. The gut itself even communicates with you throughout your runs, giving you hints or warnings. At first, the gut is kind of rooting for you, but if you make too much noise, kill too many monsters, or really do anything to assert your dominance, the gut gets pissed and sends more troops to stop you. That is one hell of a premise. It's certainly off-putting with its wall-to-wall -wall body horror, but it's also kind of hilarious. It's like dark humor the game. The word I would use is absurdist. I mean, this is a world where if you're getting low on health, you can just eat no. your gun. And if the gut is still mad at you after an attempt, you can assuage him by giving him money at the kiosks in the Elysian field type place, which you traverse atop a talking bike. I really dig this field too. Unity engine games are notoriously bad at rendering draw distances, but Golden Light takes a page out of Silent Hill's book by masking it with fog. Only in this case, the color palette makes everything seem calm and simultaneously anxiety inducing. I really had to adjust the way I think about roguelikes. Usually the more you play these games, the more you learn how to move efficiently through the floors and speed up your run. But given that running makes noise and the gut hates sound and violence, you're approaching every try with the same walking on eggshells precision. There's also a lot of monsters who don't want to kill you, whom the gut is especially protective of, and the most common monsters are mimics that turn the concept of Gary's Mob prop hunt into a Cronenborgian nightmare. I get more surreal Madoka Magica feel from these baddies. Like, wow, what a creative design. What? What the fuck is wrong with you for making this? It's disturbing, disorienting, disgusting, and I'll be happy to put this whole mess behind me. Just one more try. I was really close that last time. So, you know that thing we said before about taking something ordinary and perverting it? We actually borrowed that adage from Junji Itso, a mangaka most famous for horrific works like Gyo, Tomie, The Enigma at Amigara Fault, and Uzumaki. You know, the one with all the spirals, this is my hole, it was made for me, does any of this ring a bell? Why are we talking about manga? Well, because Junji Itso was cited as one of the chief inspirations for our next game, World of Horror. I love how many different kinds of games we're hitting today. A horror visual novel? Who would have guessed? Okay, I see now. But is that really so surprising? You know people have written horror books before, right? Huh? You know, books. Those things you find at a library. They are like comics, but thicker! Ah, okay. Like comics. I gotcha. I gotcha. Ugh. Another early access game. World of Horror resembles an 80s DOS game and mixes Junji Ito and HP Lovecraft's story themes to tell a story of a seaside village where something strange is going on. You're tasked with solving a number of mysteries afflicting the town, and you know how I love me some mystery games, but as you do, you uncover the conspiracy of an elder god threatening to unravel the very fabric of your town's reality. It's also got some random encounters where you need to measure your stats and make fight or flight decisions. If your stamina or reason hits zero, you die and it's all over. But if you take too long and the doom meter hits 100, the town becomes unsavable. So while at first this seems like a mystery game with five situations randomly chosen from a bank of 12, after multiple tries you learn to recognize each mystery and recognize the game for what it is, a resource management game. If I can roll back on something I said earlier, there was a time when all the horror games were just dimly lit shooters and a lot of critics, myself included, complained that you had too much power. The monsters aren't really scary. And while there's truth in that, it's also oversimplifying the argument. We got kind of an overcorrection in horror after that. Amnesia The Dark Descent was a breath of fresh air, but it also started this trend of absolute helplessness in horror games. This works sometimes, see, presentable liberty, but then every game becomes nothing but running and hiding, no choices to make. And if you can't make choices, it's not really a game. World of Horror gives you tons of choices. In fact, it's scary how many choices you have because so few of them will feel like they're the right one. Yeah, like I'm one of those people who still think of Resident Evil 4 as a survival horror game because the whole time you're trying to conserve ammo. And when that ammo's getting low, well, that's the tension. World of Horror is a lot like that. Uh-oh, I'm low on stamina. The Doom Meter's getting high. I don't have time to go buy items. I need to scare more recruits into helping me. Oh god, did I mess this up? But, like, 
it's weirdly fun. It gives me that darkest dungeon kind of stress where I want to learn to do it better. And if you want to get real saucy, there's custom modes where you can pick other heroes with different skills and different elder gods to invade the town, changing how you go about defeating them. There's also a quick play mode that randomizes those choices for you, and its design makes it well suited for the modding community to add new features. And they nailed the Ito art style. This game is my absolute shit. I guess you could say, it's my game. It was made for me. You know, Shiko, we're doing pretty good about hitting the different kinds of horror games. How about one of those clickbaity creepypasta ones you hate so much? Hold on. I think I have just the thing. Faith, the Unholy Trinity, is a series by Erdorf Games. Made in 8-bit graphics to emulate the look and limitations of old horror games on systems like DOS and the Apple II. And while it's the kind of jump scare fueled diversion devs make over the weekend for Jacksepticeye to overreact to, Take a closer look, and there is a lot going on under the hood. Well, I do like me these short and sweet games with retro graphics, so what's going on here? Well, in all three games, you play as priests called upon to exercise demons. Wait, so this is three different games? Yeah, and the third game is only a demo right now, but the full trilogy will be out as a single title soon. But if that feels like cheating, I even think the first one on its own would be worthy of the spot. And it was all made by one guy, Mason Smith. Credit goes to him for making something absolutely terrifying. Terrifying, huh? Well, this voice synthesizer is pretty upsetting. A dog with one bullet. Yeah, back in the 80s, programmers thought this was cutting edge, but Mason knows full well how off-putting it is. More this. And you got this monster following you that you gotta keep away with your holy symbol. Freaky, right? In a funny way, yeah. Oh my god, what the hell is happening? So, truly terrifying? Why is it rotoscoped? See, Scott, that, that is how you do a jump scare. And that's far from its only trick. These moments are used sparingly. Most of the time, things are kept stiff and simplistic. Kind of in eldritch minimalism. Oh, we are so coining that term. And in minimalism, every detail they do decide to include becomes so much more valuable, like the small white collar on the priest's otherwise monochromatic sprite. The sound design is full of old school bit crunch. It's freaky as hell, but the game also pulls out these tense but quiet moments, like this room full of mannequins. This is so scary. They're like four pixels. It goes to show you, you don't need heavily detailed blood and gore to get a reaction. Sometimes the truest horror is filled in by the player's imagination. Or sometimes it's meticulously rotoscoped. The second game is bigger and better, though I have a personal soft spot for the purity of the first game. Either way, they're all worth playing, especially given their bite-sized length. Good. I don't think I want to look at this for more than an hour. At number four, we have another single person project, Anatomy by Kitty Horror Show. Kitty has been making soul meltingly good art for years, all on the subject of dread, knowing something is wrong, but not being able to put your finger on why, or if you're actually in any danger at all. I'd gladly place any of her games on this list, but I'd say Anatomy is her absolute best. Another art house game? Is that a problem? Well, no, it's just, I haven't heard of the last, like, four titles before you suggested them for this video, so I'm trying to keep up. Okay, take your time. No one's rushing you. Okay. So, we're in a dark house. I mean, it's poorly lit, but there's nothing particularly sinister about it. It's just empty. And very quiet. Uh, Chica, you have a line there. Chica? You're supposed to talk about the plot. Uh, okay, I'll do it. So, we find this tape, put it in a tape recorder, and it's this monologue about how the anatomy of a house is like a human body, where every room serves some kind of function. Okay, I get how progression works here, we just need to keep collecting tapes. It's another walking simulator. Shika? Hello? Um... Okay, it's very dark. It feels kind of like when you're a little kid and you get up out of bed way past your bedtime, when everyone else is already asleep. Not quite, I'm not supposed to be here, but everything about this comforting setting is a little off. We eventually get to this bedroom. 
the tape recorder explains how the bedroom is where we're most vulnerable, that if something were to happen to us at home, it would happen here. Sheikha? Anyone? Damn it, where are you? Okay, these tape recordings are getting really weird, actually. They're skipping. And it wants me to go into the basement. Okay, things are moving around when I'm not looking. What is going on here? I think this house hates me. What is this game? I is there a monster in here somewhere? Are, are we back inside the gut? Am I gonna get rotoscope jump scared again? What the hell is happening with this house? Hey, Ugh! sorry, I'm back. Jesus, Chica, where were you? What? I had to feed my cats real quick. How are you liking anatomy, by the way? Um, I don't know what to say. Well, were you actually in danger? Uh, not really. Did something feel wrong? Yeah. And you don't quite know why? Uh-huh. Yeah, that's dread. Oh. Oh, wow. Well, too bad we spoiled it for the audience. Oh, no, no, you're not even halfway through the game yet, but you get the idea. And hopefully our audience does too. Oh, sweet Jesus. Hey, are you gonna be okay? <sighs> yeah, I'm fine. It's just, I'm really out of my comfort zone here. Well, the next one is just for you. You mean we get to talk about... Go nuts. Oh, hell yeah! Alien Isolation. Compared to all of these off-kilter indie projects, this one's a licensed game with a huge following, and for good reason. This game is incredible. Oh yeah, it's definitely more of a blockbuster horror, but there is nothing wrong with that. It knows what it's doing and it does it so, so well. Taking place between the first and second Ridley Scott movies, Alien Isolation follows Amanda Ripley on a mission to recover the flight recorder of her mother, Ellen Ripley's ship. Some dramatic irony here because we all know what happened in that first movie, but Amanda's about to learn the hard way. You spend some time meeting all the boring crew members that don't matter and boarding an out-of-service space station where we're supposed to find that recorder. And the real star of the show arrives, the Xenomorph. Part of what made the original Alien movie so good is its combination of horror genres. It's a monster movie, but it's also a slasher movie, but it's also a sci-fi movie. The Alien is smart and isolation goes above and beyond in conveying this not just in story, but in game mechanics. This is a true achievement in enemy design, as the alien adapts its own strategies to combat yours. If you like hiding in the air vents, the alien quickly catches on and takes more care to check them. If you use the motion tracker a lot, the alien will start listening for its beeping, using it to find you or just standing still so that you think it's gone. Not even the save rooms are safe, as saving the game requires a few vital seconds, and the alien will even start guarding them if it notices you using them too often. It makes me wonder if it's on purpose that this game's initials are AI. I'm personally not a huge fan of mixing gun-happy sci-fi with horror, but Isolation finds that happy balance. You have a few guns at your disposal, but aside from the flamethrower, they're all utterly useless against the Xenomorph. These weapons still serve a function, however, because the ship is also crawling with smaller enemies, like hostile human survivors and security robots that do not discriminate between you and the bloodthirsty man-eater. You can still fight these guys, but even that might be too risky as they take up health and resources that you really should be saving for the main monster. Or worse, your fighting them might attract the big mama. You also have this crafting system, but you'll constantly have to ask yourself if it's worth it going out of your way to collect items, or if you want to just bolt for the door. And sometimes you might have to decide between crafting a medkit to patch up your wounds, or a noisemaker that might just be your get out of lunch free card. There's a lot of actions at your disposal, but one by one they become less viable because the alien learns from every single one of your successes. The game is immaculately designed in terms of its mechanics, but it's not perfect. I don't love how long you have to go between save points. As much as I want death to have consequences, this goes just a touch overboard. It doesn't help that the game can take as long as 20 hours to complete on your first run, too. Too much of a good thing, guys. You could have easily cut that in half, and I think the experience would have been a bit better for it. True, but this is a chess game between you and an inhumane mastermind. I relish every minute we spend learning how the other one thinks. 
the game even secretly adjusts its difficulty, similar to Resident Evil 4, so no matter your skill level, it'll always be a worthy opponent. Sounds like the Xenomorphs playing dumb. I mean, hey, she likes to play with her food. And she's up there as one of the best unkillable stalker enemies in the medium, with the likes of Nemesis, Mr. X, and of course... Geometry Steve! So if you're like me and need something to do while you're getting spooked, this is the horror game for you. Hey, so I heard you mention Resident Evil a minute ago. You mean it's finally that time? Yup, it is time to pick the most evil Resident. Granted, this is different than determining the best game in the franchise. If I had to choose, I'd probably say the Resident Evil 2 remake. And I've grown very fond of Resident Evil 8, but both of these lean away from their horror roots to be more of a bombastic roller coaster. Same can be said of 5 and 6 with diminishing returns. The original 3 still hold up in terms of horror, but in terms of game... I can't go back to those tank controls, man. And while the remakes are good, I always feel conflicted over parts from the originals that got cut out. I still want them to make one of those remakes for Code Veronica. Keep up a Resident Evil 4, though. It doesn't need your help. Fun fact, the reason why 8 was getting a little more on the goofy side is because in Japan, Capcom was getting bombarded with complaints that the previous game was way too scary. So... It sounds like Resident Evil 7 is our winner, and I think that silver medal is justly earned. I was a little concerned when I saw that they were making this game first person, but I admit limiting your field of vision is a good way to increase your vulnerability. In fact, this is how Shinji Mikami wanted the original Resident Evil in 96 to be, but the technology just wasn't there yet. That's why we have the pre-rendered Spencer Mansion. In a way, Resident Evil 7 not only feels like a return to form, but a return to the author's original intent. Taking place in backwoods Americana, a la Deliverance or The Hills Have Eyes, Seven distances players from the world and lore of the series and makes them start fresh. Ethan Winters is a less experienced and less capable protagonist and asks all the questions we the players want to ask, mainly what the hell is this place? Why won't this woman die? Especially in this opening segment, you can see a lot of inspiration from PT in these cramped corridors, since this is where a lot of those designers went after Konami lost their absolute fucking mind. And while the game is, in my personal opinion, starving for more basic enemy types, it also introduces us to the incredibly compelling Bakers. Early on, we're... <clears throat> treated to this dinner sequence that beautifully and atrociously establishes the dynamics between our major villains. And you become an unwilling member of this dysfunctional family. Jack Baker especially works on two levels. To us, he's this immortal psychopath put on this earth to make us miserable. But to him, you're the annoying kid he just adopted who needs to learn some fucking manners. He couldn't care less about your attempts to stab him. It makes dealing with him uncomfortably close to dealing with an abusive father. And I think that's where the best horror lies, in the domestic and the familiar. I can see why this was maybe too real for some players. Though strangely, this six hour game doesn't maintain this level of fear and helplessness. If anything, it evolves it. You'd expect to work your way from the bottom of this boss hierarchy and fight Jack last, but you almost do the opposite, as slowly through the course of the game your skill and equipment, as well as Ethan's resolve, improve to the point where this isn't unlike one of the more power trip resi games. And honestly, I think that's the most brilliant thing this game has going for it. The horror actually amounts to character growth, and through it you do get stronger. Rather than trying to keep you a victim through the whole experience like isolation, RE7 has you triumph through its darkness until you're as much of a badass as Chris Redfield or Leon Kennedy. And this effect wouldn't work if the beginning of the game wasn't so scary. As an action horror game, it has its maggot-infested cake and eats it too. That's not to say that there's nothing to worry about after the first few segments. Replays of this game not only buff the bad guys, but give them new behaviors and shuffle the locations of items. So there's plenty to come back to. And if you think you've seen all there is to see, you could always play it in VR. Yeah, no thank you. These frantic struggles hit a lot different in VR. I actually could not get through it without taking the headset off. If you haven't noticed by now, I'm kind of a connoisseur of horror games. A spooky sommelier, if you would. But... 
Rarely have I seen one break so many rules and get away with it quite like Resident Evil 7 has. I kind of wish Capcom kept more to this style, but honestly, they damn near perfected it on the first try. Besides, if they did decide to stay the scary, we might not have gotten Heisenberg or Lady Demetrice, and that is just a risk I am not willing to take. So, feeling better? You know what? Yeah. I am. Ready to finish this? Let's do it. For our final entry, we're going to tell you a little story about a Taiwanese game developer called Red Candle Studios. In 2017, they created a small but ambitious horror game called Detention. Detention is a side-scroller set in 1960s Taiwan, which at the time was under martial law by the Chinese government. If you know anything about the political turmoil between Taiwan and China, well, we're not going to go into the details, but long story short, oppression, violence, riots, more violence, and tragedy. Detention was released to moderate success, allowing Red Candle Studios the budget to create their next game. One of the designers used a placeholder image with a rather crude political statement written in the code, which slipped through the cracks and ended up in the final product. That image involved a certain honey-loving cartoon bear and a certain Chinese military chairman, and well, if you know, you know. Suffice to say, the Chinese government didn't appreciate this, and they're a dangerous enemy to have if you're trying to sell games internationally. So Red Candle Studios had their business license revoked, their games pulled off of Steam, and that was supposed to be the end of it. However, in March of 2021, Red Candle Studios came back with a vengeance and circumvented their removal from Steam, selling their next game at great legal risk on their own website. That game was Devotion. And Devotion is something else. If Silent Hill is the teacher for how to do psychological horror, Devotion is its star pupil, taking many elements from the former and honestly improving upon them. And like Anatomy in the beginning of Resi 7, Devotion finds its horror by exploring a simple home. We start by getting intimately familiar with the family, the patriarch Feng Yu, his wife Gan Li Feng, and their daughter Du Mei Xin. The environmental details set the scene beautifully and naturally. Looking through his belongings, you can tell Feng Yu loves nothing more in life than having a family. On the other hand, Li Feng's shrine to her former career as an actress leads us to believe maybe she misses her older life. And a video of Mei Shin at a trivia competition and the video cutting and repeating as Mei Shin answers incorrectly and loses sets up an immense pressure she feels herself under. What a perfect setup to tear this family absolutely apart. What we see in the game is very metaphorical, much like Silent Hill. It represents the anxieties and turmoil these characters undergo rather than their literal existence, the sights and sounds growing more and more twisted with each passing year. But you're not fighting triangle-faced monsters in Devotion, in fact, you're not doing much at all. It's another walking simulator, with some puzzles thrown in to test your understanding of the context around you. But you know, I think making this list raised my opinion of walking sims. I usually ask myself in these kinds of games, why is this a game? Wouldn't it have been better as a movie or a book even? But in Devotion, Anatomy, Presentable Liberty, all of these games, the experience relies on the fact that we are in this space. We choose how we move through it, even if it's only back and forth a few inches. The story happens because we turn around to perceive it. And in this case, it's not enough to tell us what happens to this family, not even enough to show us. It has to bring us along. You could call this game an empathy engine. It uses abstract imagery and just amazing sound design to put you in the shoes and situation that hopefully you'll never have to experience firsthand. Because at the heart of the matter, the demons that torment this family are scarier than pigmen or xenomorphs or animatronic pizza bears. Because they're real. Behind the Sturm and Drang, there's a very real situation that not only can happen, but happens all the time, particularly in Taiwan. I don't want to describe it here and risk spoiling the game, but do a little research after you finish it. The banality of evil is at play here and it's absolutely chilling. And you can especially feel that reality with effects like the live action acting on the TV. It's so dissonant to see this amongst the animated textures. It's like a less in your face version of that faith trick with the rotoscoping, changing its art medium to punctuate particular points until everything feels uncanny. And like Sheikah said, the sound design. 
full of perfectly timed, perfectly pitched effects, sets the mood with a beautiful music score that actually plays a diegetic part of the story. Bottom line, if you like Silent Hill 2, play this game. If you want to support a lesser known developer, please go play this game. And if you want to play what might be the greatest horror game to this day, play this game. Devotion nails the horror tropes, plays like a dream, and looks like a living nightmare, and it will sit with you days after you watch the credits roll. In my humble opinion, as a horror junkie. And mine as a horror noob. It's a testament to the genre, and with that, congratulations everyone. You weathered the horrors, and I hope you find yourself a stronger person on the other side. Or, at least more informed. Thank you for keeping up with us. Now I, for one, am ready to play something a bit more comforting. I'm the Green Scorpion. And I'm Sheikah Arts. And may you all rest well from this horrific showcase. You guys have a very, very happy Halloween. <laughs>